We want to welcome all to His Glory Nation. From east to west to north to south, we bring you our latest teaching in the Gospel of John. Tonight we'll be in God, uh, John 19. And as we always do, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west to north to south to be the true teacher in the living Word of God, which is our Savior, Christ the Lord. Okay, today is uh, the Gospel of John, which is a holy book in the Quran and a, obviously a holy book in Christianity to show you who truly the Christ is and why he went to the cross, what was the, what was the verdict of, of his uh, uh, going to the cross. But before we get in there, we want to go back to 18, John 18, just a little bit. We, we highlighted this a little bit uh, in, our, in our last study, but I want to go more depth into the, uh, into the, um, into the Greek and what is actually being said. When Jesus, when Jesus was taken, when they came up to Jesus, uh, Judas uh, brought in the guards at night and they said, are you uh, Jesus of Nazareth? Uh, Jesus um, replied back and in our English, uh, it says, I am he. So we just don't, you know, look at, it, it, we just look at, okay, well, yeah, I, am, I am Jesus of Nazareth. But if we go into the Greek, he's saying something amazing. He's saying, and he was questioned three times and three times he says, I am he. And we'll go to the actual Greek, uh, what I am he means in the original Greek. So what it means in the original Greek is the word I is ego. That's where we get our, our uh, word egotistical, all about myself. So ego means I. But a may e in the Greek means uh, to be, to have been, and to be present. I am he who was, is, and will always be. So Jesus is saying... Three times, again, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I am that I am. This is another I am statement. Three times that the Lord is saying in the Greek. That's what a may e is so precise that that's what that means. And so precise, we see it in the, in the English that when he says this, that the guards fall down. And we don't get what that means. Well, what do you mean the guards fell down when they saw this? They, they were just afraid of him and then they arrested him. We have to go to the actual Greek word. The Greek, Greek word is pipto. And pipto in the Greek means to go from an erect position, means standing up to a prostate position. So what they literally did was bow down to the king, the I am that I am. So the power of Jesus Christ being I am that I am, which he literally says in the Greek, ego amei, three times, that power brought them to bow down to the Most High Christ uh, right at his feet. Then, obviously, their hardened heart continued. But we miss that unless we go back and study that, the, the original Greek, and what it actually means. And it just blows you away how precise the Word of God is. And it also blows you away how hard their heart were, was and is. And uh, for them to bow down and know that this is the I am that I am, and he, they're going to continue to take him to the cross, uh, even though they know he's, uh, he is who he says he is. And we know Pilate knew that too, because his, wa his wife had a dream. And uh, there's some uh, secular history to show that uh, Pilate's wife was one of the first Christians. And some believe that Pilate actually became a born-again uh, believer in Jesus Christ before his death. Again, he went to the, uh, death the third time for bribery. And we'll explain that a little bit more detail when we get into John 19. So uh, we invite the Holy Spirit to come down to be our true teacher in our study in John 19. We're going to show you a... Um, a, uh, a unique um, code inside John 19 that just gives you uh, goose pimples and chills when you know what this means in the, uh, in, in, in the writings of the word, uh, in the rabbi code. It's absolutely mind-boggling. We'll show you what those letters mean and tell you exactly what those mean. So let's get into the scripture. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Remember we said before that there were, you know, people said, oh, well, Pilate, that was a wonderful story. But this, this guy never existed. Again, in Caesarea, they found the, the, the Pontius Pilate Senate uh, plaque. There is a duplicate of it in Caesarea today. But the original uh, is in the, Jew, is in the uh, Jewish mu Museum in Israel today. So there was a Pontius Pilate, exactly the way the scripture said. And the soldiers twisted crowns of thorns and put it on his head, and they put him in a purple robe. So they, they took the crowns of the thorns and put it on his head to mock him. 
and purple is a sign of deity. So they put up the purple as, okay, you think you're the king, we'll give you a purple, and, and, and later they say scarlet as well. Then he said, hail king of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands, mocking him, and, so, and saying, hail king of the Jews, and then striking Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that, that the most high God coming down through the Son of God and being God in the flesh, they strike him when he's coming down to redeem the land. But it was a triumph, not a tragedy. He had to do it for our sins, past, present, and future. Pilate then went out again and said to him, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may find no fault in him. So Pilate's thought was, Okay, let's scourge him, let's mock him, let's bring him back out because I don't want this, his blood to be on my hands. My wife had a dream. Uh, I'm in a pickle because... If I know that the man's innocent, I know my wife has given me pressure that not that this is an innocent man. I know he's an innocent man, so my morals are telling me to let him go. I'll do everything I can to let him go, but the Jewish Sanhedrin have something on me. It was uh, it was in Jewish tradition, and uh, I believe it was done by uh, Josephus. I'm not quite sure, but there but there there is uh, secular evidence to prove that. Uh, Pontius Pilate had been uh, reprimanded by Caesar uh, two times prior to this. So if the, the, the people were unhappy, they had a way to appeal to a higher court, if you will. As Paul appealed to Caesar, you are allowed to appeal to Caesar. And the Jewish Sanhedrin appealed to Caesar two times prior about a Pontius Pilate, and it had to be around taking money, bribes. And this was also going to be the, the, his death because uh, we're going to see that he took a bribe to uh, uh, to to say that the the the, the guard that that somebody the the Jewish disciples took the body of Christ away, and ultimately that was in that was his that was his third strike, and it was to Caesar, and he was put to death by Caesar. So he was in a pickle that he knew that if he didn't placate them and do what they wanted, that's why they're they're mentioning Caesar so many times. We have no king but Caesar. So here they are, the Jewish people saying, the waiting for the Messiah, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Messiah, the king. He's here, and they're saying, we don't have any king but Caesar, a Roman king. And Pilate is in a pickle because if he, if he doesn't, denies their wish and they appeal, he knows that's it. That's strike three, and you're out, so to speak. So then Jesus came wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe, and Pilate said to him, behold the man, trying to mock him in front of the people. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Have you ever seen a, a riot with people coming out of hand? All it takes is one loud person to say something, and then the crowd gets all riled up and follows this chant. It was a minority of the group of people that wanted to put him to death, but the outrage spun out of control. As you see, riots go all over the place. And maybe they just take one act of violence. And then all of a sudden it just takes it, it just, just floods out of control. And this is what's happening here. They start chanting, crucify him, crucify him. Why are they crucifying him? Because he claims to be the son of God. That is why the Jewish people in the Sanhedrin wanted to put him to death. So this nonsense that says that Christ never said he was the son of God or the people never said he was the son of God, that's why he went to the cross. That's why he was being at, at, executed because of capital punishment. Capital punishment was taken away from the Sanhedrin in 6 AD, and only the Romans could do that. And that's why uh, the, the, the Romans in 6 AD, or the Sanhedrin in 6 AD, they covered themselves with sackcloth and ashes because they believed in the Torah and Genesis that God had lied to them. As Jacob gave his blessing to the 12 tribes of his 12 sons of Israel, one to Judah was, the scepter shall never leave Judah till Shiloh comes. The scepter means the kingship shall never leave the tribe of Judah until the Messiah comes. Shiloh is another term for Messiah in the Old Testament. And so in 6 AD, when the Romans took away capital punishment from the Sanhedrin, they allowed them to do their legal laws uh, or their religious laws, but they could not have capital punish anymore, uh, punishment anymore. So they believed that God lied at that time. And they covered themselves with sackcloth and ashes because they believed the scepter was taken away from them, capital punishment, and Shiloh had not come back yet. They didn't know that a little boy in Nazareth, Jesus Christ, was born in a manger, and he was fulfilling exactly the way God told his, his, uh, his, his patriarch, Jacob. So they said, crucify him, take him and cross, uh, crucify him, for I find no fault in him. There's no fault. I'm washing my hands clean. There's nothing wrong. There's no fault in him. He didn't do what you say he did. 
Then the Jews answered, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die. So here again, in the book of John, it is telling us, in the Greek, the original, why he's put to death. So I'll, I'll read it here. Again, this is the gospel. This is a gospel that's considered a holy book in the Quran. But the, the Quran doesn't tell you what the gospel means. The gospel is all about the Christ being the Son of God and God in the second head. And here is why they're putting him to the cross. Jesus an, or the Jews answered and we said, We have a law. According to our law, he ought to die. According to the Torah, he ought to die. Because he made himself the Son of God. So he's going to the he, he we, he's got to go because of the Torah. He claims to be the Son of God, and that's blasphemy. Either he's the Son of God or it's blasphemy. No two two other ways about it. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid because now he's put in a corner that he's got to crucify him, or they're going to appeal to Caesar, and that's it. That's it for Pilate. And he went into the Praetorium and said to Jesus, "Where where are you from?" But Jesus gave him no answer. And then Pilate asked him again. Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and a power to release you? So he's saying, you're not speaking to me? Can you imagine not speaking when they asked, uh, when they brought Christ up and said, uh, do, you, do you believe in these grounds? You're going to capital punishment. You're going to death. And you're, and you're wrongly accused. And you sit silent and allow that to happen to fulfill Bible prophecy? Nobody would. They would at least, they would, they would explain their case that I might have been wrongly accused. But Jesus knew that the father never took the cup. The three times he says, pass this cup. If there's any way, take this cup. And the father didn't take the cup. So there's no other way to get to heaven but through the blood of our Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God and God in the second head. He took that cup for us and he, he filled our iniquity with it and pinned it on the cross. Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? He's, I'm Pilate. I can kill you if I want to. And Jesus answered, you could have no power against me unless it was given to you from above. Meaning the only reason you have the power is because my, my father has allowed you to be in this position at this time for his purpose and his glory so that I would go to the cross to redeem the world. That's how much God loved us. He put all these pieces in, in the puzzle perfectly together from the beginning of the world so this could happen. Because God could have sent down legions of angels to destroy Pilate and destroy all of them and rescue his beloved. But this had to be done for victory. As it says in, Genesis, in the Torah, Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. That is Satan. Satan lost on Calvary when Christ went to the cross. Now it's just a matter, what team do you pick? It's, just a, it's a heart story now. It's a love story. Do you choose Jesus with your heart, your soul, and your mind, and, and let him be Kairos, Lord of your life, and then walk in his way? and walk away from the sins, past, present, and future, and have him cleanse you? Or do you live for the world or any other religion or any other way? There's only one way. And Jesus says, narrow is the gate. Narrow. And it's the shepherd's gate. It's through the Messiah here. Jesus said, you could not have, unless it was given to you above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has greater sin. Whoa-oh, and they do. The greater sin, because they knew, as he said in, the early, in John 18, they bowed down to him. They knew, and they knew the scripture. They had everything, but it was a greed in their power and their authority that they wanted. They wanted to have power and religion instead of love relationship that they just denied the Christ. And before people say, well, those Jewish people are the, the ones that put Christ on the cross. No, you put Christ on the cross. I put Christ on the cross. We all put Christ on the cross because we're all born with a, a sin nature in us. And we are not uh, worthy of the love of the Lord because of the sin nature in us unless he takes the sin away. And there had to be a perfect sacrifice, that perfect lamb, as it is in Exodus, the perfect lamb without spot or wrinkle that had to take the hyssop and the blood over the door, which formed the, the sign of the cross. That was the lamb of God to take the sin of the world away for us because we put him there. And many religions have taken that out of context and, and tried to persecute Jews for that. No, it wasn't the Jewish people that did it. It was all of us. It was for a victory for the Lord to defeat Satan as long as we accept him in our heart. From Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, If you let the man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Oh, you're not Caesar's friend. So it's an implied threat. So if you let him go, you're, you're, you're not following Caesar, as in, 
If you let him go, we're going to Caesar. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to trump you here, pun intended. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. So he says, if he makes himself a king and you're calling him the king of Jews, there's only one Caesar, and that's Caesar. So he's against Caesar. So you're going even, even worse. So he's, he's, back, he's, he's backed into a corner now. So when Pilate therefore heard the saying, he brought Jesus out and sat him down in the judgment seat in a place called the pavement, but in, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. So the pavement of the judgment seat. And there will be a judgment seat for all mankind. And every knee will bow, as it says, pento in the Greek, will bow down and acknowledge that Christ is a king, the Lord, our Savior, the Son of God, and God in the second head at the white throne judgment. Judgment is coming, and we pray that each and every person finds the Lord Most High through His Son, Jesus Christ, with their heart, because we want to be with Him in eternity forever. Praise His name. Uh, now is the preparation day of the Passover, about the sixth hour. Sixth hour is the uh, is the, is noon, so they were getting preparation for the Passover. The Passover would start at sundown, so it would be about six more hours before sundown came. So they were preparing for it, and he said to the Jews, "Behold, your king." So he's kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, but he's still mocking them back to show that they don't have complete control over him. He said, "Behold, your king." They, but they cried out, and they said, Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Oh, so that put him right back in the place. We, we're following the Roman law. We're not saying that this is the Messiah. We're denying him. Then he delivered him up to be crucified, so, that Jesus, uh, so they took Jesus and led him away. And, uh, and he was bearing his cross. He went out and called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. So he's bearing his cross as we see uh, he was t taken out. Uh, I, there is a place of the cross in Israel that uh, they now believe that the, uh, the, the, the place where Jesus was buried at Joseph of Arimathea, uh, his tomb uh, is called the Garden Tomb. There was some speculation a couple of years ago that it could be one place or another place, but most, most scholars are pretty convinced that the Garden Tomb is the place. I've been to the garden tomb. We actually, uh, it was a great uh, place walking into the tomb that they, they, where Jesus was actually laid to rest, uh, but he was never dying. Um, and, and there is a rock formation that is amazing. It's Golgotha. It's literally a skull, and I have pictures of that. I should post that up there if I can find them. But this is exactly the way the scripture is. Or you go outside of Jerusalem and see that by the garden tomb, it is the rock of a skull where they crucified him and two others with him, one on the other side and Jesus in the center. So the two robbers and the thieves the left on the right, remember Barabbas, son of your father, pun, son of your father, the devil. He was the, the lowest of the low. He was a murderer. He was, you don't, go to, you don't go to a crucifixion in Roman times unless you were the worst of the worst. I mean, you were, uh, you were a mass murderer. You were the worst of the worst. And that is, the, he literally took the spot of Barabbas, son of your father, son of your father, the, the devil. And this is showing a pun that Jesus is the son of the true Abba, the father. And that's how precise the Lord is. Now, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and it was in writing. This is amazing. This gives you absolute chills. He put uh, in a writing on the cross and God supernaturally, the father supernaturally made this happen. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Nobody knows why he did this. What, did he do this to mock the Jews because he was forced to do this? Did he do this out of divine intervention? Either way, the Lord's hand, the Father, was on this. We'll tell you why. It tells, well, first we'll go into 20, and then we'll explain to you what it means in the Hebrew code. <coughs> Excuse me. Then many of the Jews read this title. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And there's something called the, the rabbi code. And you drop the seventh letter and it gives you a, a code throughout the scripture. Like in the book of Genesis, every 49 letters, which is intervals of seven, it has uh, a Boaz, uh, Obed, Jesse, David, showing that David would be the king of Israel. Um, and uh, many different other uh, codes throughout, throughout the Bible. What's unique about this is the unpronounceable name of God is called Yahweh. 
as the, the Jewish people would say, uh, that you cannot even, God is so powerful, you cannot even pronounce the name of Yahweh or Elohim. They call him Yahweh, Jehovah God. Um, so they just give him a four letter unpronounceable name. And this is the four letters. It's Y-H-W-H. So why does that matter? So when you drop the Hebrew code of Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, what's its spell and code? Y-H-W-H. Amazing how God from outside of time and space puts the code in there that this is God himself. He is put on the cross, Yahweh. Amazing, just absolutely amazing. And only God could do that. Only the, the God of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Elohim, the God of Jehovah, the God of three. Therefore, the chief priests and the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what has been written has been written. So the Lord Most High, the Father, had the oversay so that the code would be there for all to know that this is the Son of God and God in the second head. Amazing. Verse 23, Then the soldiers, when they were crucified, Jesus took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. And now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. So they couldn't, what they would do is they'd take the clothes and, and use them for value. So they couldn't split up this one, uh, his last piece, because there was just one seam to it. And so they're going to have to draw lots to see who gets this, according to Bible prophecy. Psalm twenty-two, eighteen, 18, and verse 24. They said there among themselves, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it. Whose shall it be? That the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Fulfilling King David, what he prophesied in Psalm 22, verse 18, word for word. Absolutely amazing. Again, David in Psalm 22, she talked about the crucifixion of the Messiah a thousand years before crucifixion was ever invented by the Medes and Persians, telling you that God is outside of time and space and everything is perfect and it is done exactly the way God said it would be through his, his, uh, King David uh, way back in Psalm 22, 18. Amazing. Now there it stood by the cross of Jesus' mother and uh, of his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. So the Marys were there. This is going to be a very important thing and why, he, that, why Jesus does what he does. When Jesus therefore said to his mother and his disciple who loved him standing by, which is John, the author of this, John who always talks, to him, talks of himself in the third person as the one that Jesus loved, not as some kind of badge of, that he's great, but of love and the, the importance of this story is about the deity of Jesus Christ, that he is son of God and God, not me. I am just a disciple. I am just a servant telling the first eyewitness of what's going on. And he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. So he's talking to his mother, Mary. He's saying, woman, behold your son. Well, why, why, why did Jesus tell his mother to go with John? Well, we know he had uh, in, in the scripture uh, five brothers and two sisters. Uh, in, in the scripture, and two of them are, were pillars of the uh, church after the risen Christ. James and Jude wrote epistles in the New Testament. James was the, the head of the Jerusalem church, very strong pillars. And James, they found James also where I just, uh, uh, I think it was about a year and a half to two years ago, it says bar, uh, uh, it was um, um, James uh, Bar-Joseph, uh, son of, uh, or brother of uh, Yeshua, meaning the son of, son of Joseph, brother of Yeshua, meaning this is the right, this is the, the, the James. Remember that Jesus' brothers and sisters denied him up until the cross. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah. He was uh, considered a misfit. Uh, they were, he was considered an illegitimate child, even in his household. And in verse 29, they're going to reference Psalm 69, 21. But in 60, uh, Psalm 69, we see, uh, we see evidence of Jesus' uh, childhood. He was mocked by his, his family. He was mocked by the drunkards. The drunkards would make songs about Jesus. They considered him illegitimate. 
And we can see through Psalm 69, something probably happened to Joseph, and Joseph wasn't there to protect Mary and the kids to show them that Jesus was indeed who he said he was. He is the Messiah. He was the Christ from the virgin birth. And they weren't buying it. So his, his own siblings mocked him. So they didn't believe that he was the Messiah until he rose again and they saw it with their own eyes. Then James and Jude changed tr dramatically. That's why Jesus is telling Mary to go with John. He wanted her to go with somebody that believed in the risen Christ, believed in the gospel, that would have that holy presence instead of going with somebody, going with her, her, her biological children who are living of the world and who are denying. But we know that they do come together at the end. That is why he did that. Behold your mother. From that hour, that disciple took her as his own, and in his own home. Uh, and then Jesus, knowing all these things were now accomplished, the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And this will be a, a Psalm 69, 21 again. Now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there and they filled the sponge with sour wine and put it on a hyssop and put it in his mouth. Exactly the way Psalm 69 said it would happen. Amazing. But again, going to Psalm 69, you see Jesus' childhood. It was rough for him ever, all, all the way through it. It didn't start when he started his ministry. It started as a child being considered illegitimate by the, by the leaders of the, of the town he lived in, by the drunkards, the sinners were making fun of him, and his own household, his brothers and sisters were like, you're, you're Ill illegitimate. Verse 31, uh, so verse 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, according to scripture, exactly the way it would be, he says, to Telestai is finished, paid in full. And that means the high priest means paid in full. He's taken it to the cross as our teaching in the Torah. His head, he gave up his spirit. Uh, therefore, because it was a preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day. So they wanted to get the bodies down quickly. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs may be broken, that they may be taken away. Remember the scripture said, not one of his legs will be broken by the prophets. So the thief on the left and the right, they had to break the legs because the reason they break the legs is because um, when you're crucifixion, it's, you were suffocating in your own bodily fluids and you, you prep yourself up with the strength of your, of your feet so that you don't, that doesn't happen. So if you break the legs of the people, they can't hold themselves up anymore and they die quickly. And they wanted Jesus' bones to be broken because they wanted him to die and get off the cross before it was Passover because it would be unclean. Can you imagine the hypocrisy to that? But the scripture said not one of his bones will be broken. Just exactly the way it says in the Passover, in Exodus, in the Torah, not one of the lamb's legs will be broken, foreshadowing exactly the way the Son of God, the Lamb of God, would be done on the cross. God is so precise. Then the uh, soldiers came uh, and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs, fulfilling Bible prophecy to the letter. Amazing. But one of the soldiers pierced his side, and with a spear, immediately blood and water came out, exactly the way the prophet said, a piercing to the side. And that was uh, Isaiah 53, just another amazing verse. It looked like the prophet Isaiah was watching the crucifixion uh, and, and documented it as live there. Absolutely, positively amazing. And Isaiah 53 is in the Dead Sea Scrolls in Israel today. And Isaiah 53 is there showing that the Bible is absolutely, literally correct because they, this was found in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the whole book of Isaiah, the whole scroll of Isaiah is in, is in the uh, Israeli Museum today, and it's carbon dated back to 450 BC. So all these things that Jesus Christ did literally were fulfilled 450 years before Christ was even born, proving the Bible without a shadow of a doubt that it's truth. Amazing. And he has seen his testified, and his testimony is true. It is true because there's witnesses, 500 witnesses, and now we have the Dead Sea Scrolls to prove it was true. 450 years and all the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled literally to the, to the letter. As he said, I didn't come to replace the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill it to you every yacht and tittle. Crossing the I, dotting the T. Absolutely perfect. For these things were done that the scripture should be, should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken, exactly the way it was, because God the Father had it done from the beginning of the time. This was always the plan for salvation through the world, to live with Christ the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit forever, praise his name. And again, the scripture says, 
they shall look upon the one they have pierced. And they have pierced it, showing, again, crucifixion before. Amazing. David talked about crucifixion a thousand years before the Medes and Persians ever invented it. That's how great God is outside of time and space. Then Joseph of Arimathea became the disciple of Jesus, who was a believer in Jesus. And uh, people are saying this rich man gave up his beautiful tomb, and, he, and it's a beautiful garden. I mean, yeah, there's a wine press there, uh, just a beautiful tomb there. And people say, well, why did he give up his tomb? I think it was a famous, uh, Chuck Smith famously said, well, he only needed it for the weekend. And uh, that's, uh, Chuck Smith told it, that joke better than, than I can tell it, but he did. He only needed it for three days because of death would not keep him. He was a risen Christ. It was a victory. He came out of there alive and resurrected as our King of Kings, Lord of hosts, and high priest, praise his name. Uh, but secretly, the fear of the Jews asked Pilate that he may take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. We read this and we globally say, well, yeah, Joseph of Arimathea went and got the body. Do you know how hard it is to get to Pontius Pilate? Here he's the governor. There's probably over a couple million people in the city during this festival. But Joseph had enough authority to be able to get to Pilate. You know, it's one thing to be able to get to, you know, a president or a governor of your state. He had authority enough. God put him in the, same, the right position at the right time to have authority to go get the body and bring the body to where God wanted it to be, the perfect place and the perfect timing. Praise the name. Everything in God does is absolutely perfection. And Nicodemus, remember Nicodemus, the, uh, Jesus was teaching him. He was the teacher of the law. And Nicodemus means, well, what do you mean to be born again? He could, didn't understand the term born again, that we our hearts were incurably wicked, as Jeremiah said, and we need to have a new heart. And Jeremiah 31, 31 saying, I will give you a new covenant, Better than the covenant I gave to your fathers. That covenant is through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Praise his name. So Nicodemus was also a, a believer. So Nicodemus and Joseph were both helping each other get the burial body ready for God's perfect, perfect three-day awakening. Praise his name. And it first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. That's a lot of myrrh and aloe. So that was, the, 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 that was what you'd put around the body. I mean, you would, with 100 pounds, you, the mummy, you were like a mummy that you're in there. So for him to be taken out of that and harpazoed and caught away and resurrected so strong is absolutely supernatural that that happened because of all this weight that was put on him and it hardens. And uh, the, the, the Shroud of Turin, Turin is just uh, coming back into the news again. And they believe that this is indeed the, 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 the same burial cloth that Christ put on his, on, on his, uh, they put on his head. They took the body of Jesus and bound the st strips of linen with, with, with spices in the custom of the Jewish to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. It's the garden tomb, which I said earlier, most scholars believe that that is indeed the place it is. And you can go there. I, I believe the, the, the British now are responsible for this garden tomb. It's beautiful to go if you're in Jerusalem. You have to go see the garden tomb. You go off to the right, you're going to see a skull that looks just like Golgotha. You're going to go up to this beautiful wine press, exactly the way the scripture says, and you're going to see this tomb that's been there forever that the, 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 the says above there, he's, he's not here, he's risen. Absolutely be beautiful. When you walk in there and know that the, 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 the risen Christ laid his body there, just absolutely mind-boggling. Now, in the place where he crucified, there was a garden and a new tomb which no one had been laid. And we close out in verse 42. So there, so there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation today, for the tomb was nearby. So he would not stay. Death would not keep him, as the scripture said. He will be the risen Christ, and the world will know it. Over 500 witnesses. As the old saying is, you show me a God, and, I'll, and, and then you show me uh, their body, and I'll show you a dead God. Uh, and you show me a prophet, and I'll show you your dead body. I'll show you a dead prophet. This is the only one that's ever been risen from the dead as the Son of God and as God in the second head to show without a shadow of a doubt He is the risen Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life, the eternal life, if you trust your heart with Him. And if there's anybody here today that wants to accept Jesus Christ as Lord of their life, say, Jesus, 
Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins, past, present, and future. I want to make you Lord of my life, and I repent, and I want to turn a new way and get into your word and follow you and have eternal life through you. If you prayed that and you meant that in your heart, you've entered into the eternal kingdom of the Most High God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and He's going to have a love relationship for you forever, forever, and forever is a long time. Now is the time to get into His Word and get to know Him because He wants to build a love relationship with you. We pray that this has been a blessing to you. And may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you till next time. God bless.